Today we highlight the third UU principle, the acceptance of one another and the encouragement of spiritual growth. And our fourth principle, the search for truth and meaning. Okay, so spoiler alert. For those of you who think my message today is about stopping the inevitability of death, it's not that kind of church. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> I have no snakes, no oils, no wonderful transformative potions to sell you. <laughs> what I am... <laughs> What I am here to offer is a perspective for your consideration, an invitation to look at death through a different lens, more personal, more befitting to you, uh, to who you are, how you move through life, how you talk about life, and how you talk about death. This is also about how we accompany others. I watched a wonderful TED Talk by artist and TED Fellow Candy Chang, who created a wall in New Orleans for people to write on. A simple sentence, before I die, I want to. Not a bucket list, a simple truth from the heart, or perhaps whimsy. She said, thinking about your death can help you clarify your life. I agree. That is why you have a card in your order of service to write on. I want to create that wall here, so I'm going to ask you to write on the card. One thought, one idea, no name. Then put the cards in the basket at the back of the uh, church on your way out, if you are willing to share them. Or you can share them with your beloved, or you can just take them home to remind you. Here are some of the things that people wrote on that wall in New Orleans. I want to be tried for piracy. <laughs> I want to live off the grid. I want to hold her one more time. I want to be someone's cavalry. I love that last one. So I'm going to start us off. I want to remember what others have told me I cannot do and go back and do them. <laughs> when I do palliative conversations, I call myself a party planner. I like to invite as many providers and family as possible to get all the questions answered. One family meeting, we had a daughter by herself in her 60s. Mother was in her early 90s in the IMCU. Daughter was holding on to her mother returning to her previous level of functioning. There were eight of us and one of her. When she began to shake, clearly overwhelmed, I put my hand on her shoulder and encouraged her to ask her questions. I could feel her relax as she came to understand her mother's condition. I felt her let go of her guilt that she should ask for more interventions. We talked about how to prepare for her mother to come home with hospice. That was Friday. When I called her on Monday to see if she was ready for her mother to come home, I had not checked the chart. She told me her mother had actually died at the hospital on Sunday. I told her I was so sorry. And she said, me too. But she said she was so grateful for all that she had learned at that meeting on Friday. So she was not as shocked as she would have been if we hadn't met. But then she went on to say, you might want to check with mother's doctor. I asked her why. She said, well, he came back after you all left and assured me mother was not going to die right now. He was one of my favorite Jewish doctors, but we had a come to Jesus conversation when I found him later in the morning. <laughs> he had pulled the stethoscope over his eyes and focused on a different outcome, but her knowing had helped the daughter to be present with her mother in her final hours. 
With daughter, I believe we created a new narrative on suffering and healing and how to talk about preparing for the great perhaps, which is the way I heard Kathy Bates describe that recently in a movie. I love that, the great perhaps. That extends our truth beyond life in so many ways, whether we believe in the afterlife, reincarnation, or that the last hurrah is just that, the great perhaps. Exactly how does the way we look at death figure into how we accompany our loved ones on the journey? I love the message in the story today, the reminder that there is not just one way to deal with loss, and that we can hold on to who we are and those we love. Roles often change. We may be asked to be a caregiver when we are used to being cared for. We may be asked to parent our parent or reparent our child. We may need to be the yang when we're used to being the yang. We may have to reveal our fears to leave open the possibility of joy. Reimagine is a week-long set of events and discussions that happens in San Francisco about death and dying. It just happened a couple months ago. Some people recoil, including some people I work with, asking, why a week of death discussions? Because to not be able to talk about death cuts us off from so much we need to talk about in life. We often stop short of what we want to say, what we need to say, because we don't want to lose those around us. We don't want those around us to feel bad, or because to say the D word ushers it sooner. No, it doesn't. I went to the opening night of Reimagine and was privileged to witness a dialogue between two doctors I deeply admire for their passionate work on accompanying those with illness and dying. Dr. B.J. Miller is a doctor at the Zen Hospice in San Francisco. He talks about the challenges of illness in two distinctive ways. Necessary suffering dealing with the loss of what was and what is, that which we cannot change, and the unnecessary suffering we can most definitely impact by addressing the physical pain or holding the psychological, or I would also call the spiritual pain. He talks about the profound disconnect people experience when they feel cut off, even ugly because of what their lives have become. People at the end of their lives want comfort and feeling unburdened and unburdening to those they love. They want existential peace and they want a sense of spirituality. Dr. Ira Bayak has written much on palliative care and end of life, including dying well, peace and possibilities at the end of life. As his book recounts many stories of accompanying the dying, he cites Vic Victor Frankl's philosophy that physical discomfort and deprivation, no matter how extreme or brutal, do not cause suffering. The true root of suffering is loss of meaning and purpose in life. We all want to define our quality of life, that which us, affords us our humanity. And our wishes should be honored. I have witnessed loved ones struggle with doing more as a way of preserving life and moving further away from preserving spirit. To have these two on stage together was nothing short of spirit-filled. When it comes to death, we are all learners. And if we ourselves are to be with another on a difficult journey, it is a gift to ask what they want, what they need. At Reimagine, to be in the presence of about 500 people who came to hear and talk and sing and recount was magical. There was an openness quite palpable to be in the room with people who talked so much about life, and the room continued to breathe as we talked about death. We must.
keep breathing. Senior editor of the UU World, Kenny Wiley, Kenny Wiley writes on grieving. I went to church, a UU church, to be reminded through hugs from friends, awkward interactions with strangers, and inspired messages from leaders that no matter how down I feel, I still matter. I still have worth. My God says when we come together, worship together, listen deeply to one another, and love one another, this, I believe, is the God of our faith. He remembered his minister in college used to use the phrase, alone together. We experience life through our own lenses, yet we don't have to go it alone. I know too well the grieving loss of a parent is a long and exhausting road. I also know that walking alongside a mourning friend can feel somehow even more taxing. Being there for others is just plain hard. Yet I believe that in those public spaces that God or the spirit of life truly resides. It may go against prevailing American individualism to say that we need other people. We, believe, we like to believe that we can do everything on our own. I believe that the human spirit truly comes alive when we are challenged prodded and uplifted by community. People often ask, what can I do? We can be creative, people. We can be creative. If they can't get to the ballpark, do a tailgate party in the driveway. <laughs> Bad day of chemo, put them in a bubble bath and read them their favorite poetry. Get creative. Do a tea party with feather boas, regardless of the gender. <laughs> Schedule a week of your beloved's favorite movies. At each turn, learn how are they that day, that moment, without judging or demanding. And you must share how you are. Do not deprive your loved one hearing from your heart, even when it aches. I do a class here I call a light conversation on death. Now, I'm often met with double takes when I say the name. But not only do I believe we must keep laughing, that we must keep breathing, I believe we must keep laughing. So I infuse humor in the discussion as we go along. As a taste of the class, I leave you today with a couple of irreverent thoughts. So when I die, will someone please go to my funeral dressed like the Grim Reaper? Stand in the back of the room and don't say anything. <laughs> a holy roller got finally got fed up with my UU responses to his dogma one day and demanded, do you know what's going to happen to you when you stand in judgment before God? I responded, yeah, she's going to have a lot of explaining to do. <laughs> and my favorite from Sonia Christopher, who shared this at one of our classes, it's near the end of the day at the pearly gates, and there are just three people left. The first one approaches St. Peter. St. Peter asks the man his religion, and he says he's Catholic. St. Peter pages through a thick book, reads something, and then asks, did you go to church every Sunday and receive the sacraments? And the guy says, oh yes, and St. Peter lets him into heaven. The next guy approaches, and St. Peter asks, what religion he is. I'm Jewish. St. Peter again flips through the book, reads everything, and asks, did you study the Torah? Oh, yes. And St. Peter lets him into heaven. The last person approaches, and when she tells St. Peter she's a you, you, St. Peter flips through the book, looks up and says, did you bring a hot dish to share? <laughs> <laughs> 
Talking about death is hard, and we must learn to do it because it is part of life. Let us be the ones to make it so. Amen. Amen.